Dr. Michael Ruscio gives smart, busy people suffering from symptoms like daily bloating, constant fatigue, and unexplained weight gain simple steps to start living a healthy, enjoyable life again. If this sounds like you or somebody you know, then this interview is definitely for you. Good morning, Michael, and welcome to the Local Paleo Show. Morning, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Good morning, Mark. How are you today? Wonderful, thank you, as usual. And I trust you are both going to be wonderful for the rest of our time together. Let's hope so. Yeah, I'll try not to drop that. Yeah, that's always During a good interview. start. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of good. This way you can call the ambulance and get me to hospital <laughs> <laughs> if I do it online. Um, so, Michael, our uh, common friend, Rob Wolf, highly recommended you as a guest on our show, and uh, we wanted to thank you for coming on today. Um, you are a functional medicine doctor, researcher, author, and health enthusiast, and you also specialize in autoimmune, thyroid, and digestive disorder. First, uh, let's find out who you are. Can you describe your path to health and helping and how you got to help other people? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to. And it's uh, interesting. I think many people who get into functional medicine have had their own experience. And so same thing for me. I was in college planning on going into conventional medicine until I had my own health challenge. And that really kind of opened my eyes and diverted my path. And essentially, somewhat long story short, I acquired a intestinal infection, an amoeba specifically, and it wasn't manifesting as any digestive symptoms as, as many digestive infections do. So there was no bloating, diarrhea, nothing like that. But the predominant symptoms I was suffering from were fatigue, insomnia, brain fog, bouts of depression, and it, it threw me down this road of, of you know, first I went to a couple of conventional doctors, got screened, and everyone said, you know, on, on paper, you look really healthy, so everything's normal. And of course, my response to that would be, okay, I understand that your, your testing is saying that everything's normal, but I feel terrible compared to the way I felt a few months ago. There's got to be some kind of cause. And, and so I, I got really nothing there. Eventually, ended up going on the internet and doing internet research and thinking that I had hypothyroid or thinking that I had heavy metal toxicity or thinking that I had adrenal fatigue. You know, some of the, the, the typical things that come up when you search some of these nonspecific symptoms into Google, like fatigue or insomnia or what have you. Mm -hmm. So I tried a herbal thyroid support protocol. I tried some adrenal support. I tried some detox therapy and nothing really produced any, any long lasting or significant results. And I'd later found a functional medicine doctor that told me he thought that I had an intestinal parasite. And I remember thinking to myself, <laughs> no, like, no way, is, is this guy crazy? Because I had never been to a foreign country and got food poisoning and then had diarrhea and throwing up, like, like a typical course of a, an infection. But at that point, I said, well, what, what do I really have to lose here? I'll, I'll just do the stool mm -hmm. test and, and you know, not, not much to lose. And it, it ended up coming back with a amoeba and treating that amoeba was the only thing that really helped with all the symptoms that I was experiencing. And the key thing I took away from that experience was, or, or a couple things, but probably the most important was you can have a problem in the gut that doesn't manifest as gut symptoms, but solely manifest as non-digestive symptoms like fatigue, brain fog, insomnia, depression. And if you, treat those symptoms, but you don't treat where the symptoms are coming from, then you're going to be spinning your wheels forever. Mm -hmm. right. And and that same thing is what I see with many of my patients. And it, it's, it's unfortunate that there's so much information on the internet that leads you to natural treatment of the symptoms, but not natural treatment of the cause. Yeah. Right. So many of the, the patients I work with now, I try to prevent them from going down um, you know, the adrenal fatigue road or the thyroid road or the heavy metal road. Some people need to go down those roads, but if you have a digestive problem and you haven't addressed that before going into those things, then you may not really see optimum results. So I, I diverted my path, went into functional medicine, and I'm really passionate about 
functional medicine, but, but more so, I, I would say specifically, is helping people apply or, or, or find a functional medicine provider to help them apply some of the therapies in functional medicine in an efficient manner. Because that's an area where I think sometimes that there's a miss where, um, you know, if some people here have looked into functional or, or integrative or alternative medicine, they may have felt like, wow, this seems like it's maybe a little bit expensive or maybe there's kind of a lot of changes I have to make in terms of diet and supplements, but you don't necessarily have to if you're having an eye toward doing things efficiently. So that's kind of the, I guess, what I was trying to make a short answer, but now it's been kind of a long answer to your question. No, that's okay. Um, and take all the time you need. Um, so typically, Western medicine uh, treats the symptoms and not the cause and doesn't doesn't look at the whole body and uh, the interaction between the gut, the brain, and so on and so forth. Um, you mentioned functional medicine. Can you explain that to us? Sure. So functional medicine is kind of a, a subset that, you know, you can put it kind of in between conventional medicine and natural medicine. It's kind of this, this integrative medium in between the two. And it really aims to try to treat the underlying cause of disease in this, in this progressive model, oftentimes with more natural therapy. So it's not conventional medicine. That's important to mention. It's, and it's important for the healthcare consumer to understand that if you are working with or seeking out a functional medicine provider, you should still follow up with your conventional medicine doctor because they're looking for slightly different things. Conventional medicine is very good at early detection of disease and conventional management of certain diseases. Functional medicine is more so suited at chronic degenerative diseases and trying to prevent those diseases or trying to treat the underlying cause of those diseases. And it can be practiced by different types of doctors. You could have conventional medical doctors that practice. You can have naturopathic doctors that practice. You can have chiropractic doctors that practice. You have some PhDs that practice. Um, so you even have some nutritionists that, that also practice and they, they go beyond just nutritional recommendations and they start doing some lab work. But it's essentially this, this integrative type of healthcare that looks to treat the underlying cause of disease oftentimes with a foundation of dietary lifestyle and nutritional supplement interventions. So typically as a functional medicine doctor, uh, what kind of services do you offer to your patients? Well, what I try to do uh, amongst a few different things, I guess, is, is try to help people find the most efficient path to feeling well and I also take a strong look into their gut health because, again, as I laid out a, mo a moment ago, I have found that when you have all these different areas of the body that you could potentially look into for the cause of disease or symptoms, it's a very good idea to start with the gut. So my primary area of focus is someone's digestion because that oftentimes can cause what we, we think, again, is adrenal fatigue or what is uh, hypothyroid or, or where the depression is coming from or where the insomnia is coming from. And I, again, try to help people navigate through that as efficiently as possible. So if you were maybe to, to, to uh, picture like a pyramid, the foundation of the pyramid would be diet and lifestyle, right? Because before we go on, to other levels of the pyramid, like potentially ordering lab testing and treating an imbalance uh, found on the lab work, we want to make sure someone's eating a diet that is helping their health and not detracting from it mm -hmm. uh, or getting enough sleep. And sometimes these things seem like basics, but it's important to make sure someone's getting at least adequate sleep, eating a diet that's healthy for them, not under excessive amounts of stress. And the diet may be one that's the easiest to get wrong. And, and you know, so, so maybe to, to, to frame that a little bit, the paleo diet, and obviously your audience is familiar with the paleo diet, mm. but the, there, there's, there's derivations as to how you can apply the paleo diet. And, and probably the most common, I don't want to say misconception, but the most common miss can be, if, if people have underlying gut imbalances and they go on the standard paleo diet, sometimes they actually end up eating more foods that are problematic for their gut than they, than they should. But they don't understand that, you know, here's the paleo diet, 
potential menu, if you have IBS, in, um, irritable bowel syndrome, or IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, or just you know, a fair amount of gut imbalances, you may want to focus on, you know, this niche of foods and avoid some of the foods from over here. And more so what that breaks down to look like is there are foods allowed on the paleo diet that can be very healthy. However, if there are currently imbalances in the gut, some of those seemingly healthy foods can actually feed imbalances. And specifically, these are foods that um, highly feed bacteria in the gut because a fair subset of the population has overgrowths of bacteria in the gut if you eat a diet high in foods that feed bacteria in the gut you actually make that pre-existing overgrowth of bacteria worse right so what would be an example of that uh, what kind of foods would feed these bacteria so fortunately there's a, a diet that is good in cutting out all the foods that feed bacteria. This is known as the low FODMAP diet, F-O-D-M-A-P, and it's just an acronym um, that it's, it's um, low oligo dye monosaccharides and polyols. It's just a term for different types of carbohydrates and how they're, they're bound. But you're looking at things like asparagus, cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage. So these are foods that people would probably say, yeah, that's a really healthy food. And it, I mean, it, but this is where we have to get a little more nuanced in terms of what's our definition of healthy. It's not an unhealthy food, but if you're Mary Sue, a you know, 36 mother of three, and you have a lot of bloating and insomnia, then that bloating may be caused by an overgrowth of bacteria and eating lots of asparagus, cabbage, and cauliflower feed that bacteria, make that bloating worse, that bloating causes, causes inflammation in the gut, which has been shown to cause insomnia. So even though you're going on a paleo diet and saying to yourself, geez, I'm eating so healthy, why am I not feeling better? It may be because that diet, even though the foods are healthy, is not healthy for your in particular gut. And we have to make some short-term modifications to improve mm -hmm. the health of your gut. So that would be the foundation would be, would be diet. And I'll, I'll pause there for a second before I kind of go up the other uh, rung to the of the pyramid, so to speak. Right, and so uh, when you say bacteria, you're not talking about candida yeast, right? Which is another problem that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. It's more so, like what what kind of bacteria, and how do you rebalance the gut to that effect? So that's a great question. So bacteria and and fungus, they they tend to operate very similarly in the gut. Um, but I, I think what we're learning is bacterial overgrowths might be a little more common than fungal or candidal overgrowths, but they're, but they're both two of the more common imbalances that you see in the gut. Let's say compared to things like a, a parasite, like I had, like an amoeba, a, a pathogenic parasite, those are actually fairly rare, even though I, I think in natural medicine, we used to think that they were more common than they are. So I think that's a bit of an antiquated concept that everyone has, everyone has parasites and needs to treat those. I think in a lot of cases, what we end up treating with some of these gut interventions, like some of the herbal gut cleanses that people may have heard about, are actually these imbalances of the bacteria and fungus that are already in the gut and, and should be in the gut, but now they've just become overgrown. So the analogy I like to use is, it's kind of like weeding versus trimming the shrubs. Most people don't have overt weeds that need to be yanked out, like parasites need to be yanked out, but rather their shrubs are just overgrown and they need this periodic trimming of the shrubbery to make sure that things remain balanced. And there's a lot of similarities between how we treat the bacteria and how we treat the fungus. The, the general stroke for addressing fungus or candida is a lower carb diet. Right. Because carbs tend to feed the, uh, the, the candida or the fungus. But the, the one nuance that throws off more people with the bacteria is you can eat a lower carb food like asparagus, but that can also, that can be very good at feeding bacteria. So that's what I think most people miss. When most people go on the paleo diet, they inadvertently restrict a lot of the carbs, like juices, breads, crack, crackers, pastas, grains, that feed things like candida. But they a lot of times inadvertently start eating more of the high FODMAP vegetables that feed a bacterial overgrowth. 
Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, asparagus and then these other vegetables you mentioned, these are pre, um, prebiotics, right? They help grow. Precisely. Precisely. Right. So that's, that's so, another way you could say that the, the low FODMAP diet reduces foods that are high in prebiotics. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh, and then so I'm sorry, I, c coming, coming sure. back to the, uh, the other aspect of your question, you know, the other ways that we would, would help someone, which the is rebalance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's the say rebalance. someone, let's say someone has gone through the dietary piece, which can be a great way of <coughs> improving their gut health. So if they've gone paleo, but they're not feeling any better, maybe we'd have them go on the low FODMAP diet and that they still don't feel any better. Then what we may do is order a reasonable, round of testing to see if we can identify is there a bacterial overgrowth might there be a fungal or candidal overgrowth might there be inflammation in the gut and we'll start to do some testing to, tr to try to clarify where the problem is coming from and it's and it's reasonable testing that, that's important to mention because i think today's healthcare consumer is confronted when they go online and they're looking for help you, you sometimes get this overzealous testing model in, in some circles of, of uh, integrative or alternative or functional medicine. And I've been a big proponent of, of not doing any more testing than is needed and making sure that we're very discerning and precise with, with only ordering the test and it's truly going to be valuable, especially right. if someone may not have complete insurance coverage for a test, then there's going to be some out-of-pocket costs. We want to try to minimize that out-of-pocket cost. But right. the, next, the next step would be ordering some testing to try to clarify what imbalances are present. And then oftentimes there's very helpful natural medicines that can be used to correct those imbalances. Probiotics can be very helpful. Certain types of anti-inflammatory or antimicrobial herbs can be very helpful as one of the next major steps that are used uh, kind of in that pyramid I was describing to help people rebalance their gut. Cool. So that leads me to a question I've been wondering for a while now, which is why do we see more and more gut dysfunctions like uh, inflammations and uh, Crohn's disease and IBS and so on and so forth? Why do we see more of that now than we used to see like 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Probably the main contributing factor to that is probably the health of the environment that we live in, in terms of the amount of exposure that we have to bacteria, dirt, germs. This is sometimes known as the hygiene hypothesis or the old friends hypothesis. Essentially what that means is the, the more hygienic that we become, meaning we have less contact with, with uh, for example, farm animals early in life, less contact right. with, with other children, less contact with dirt and soil, more right. children are becoming cesarean birth rather than vaginal birth, more children are using formula than breastfeeding and, and breastfed children or just breast milk has more bacteria in it. Right. All these things are very important for, especially during the first few years of life, for establishing a good colonization of bacteria in the gut and, and on other areas of your body. But those bacteria help to tune and calibrate your immune system to prevent things like autoimmunity and immune and inflammatory mediated conditions later in life, like inflammatory bowel disease, potentially like IBS, things like allergy, eczema, atopic dermatitis. So I think the brunt of it probably has to do with some of these early life factors that are not present to help with the, the best formation of the immune system. And then when we don't have a, a healthy formation of the immune system, we're more prone to some of these autoimmune, immune or inflammatory conditions later in life. And we do have pretty good documentation to substantiate this. For example, we've shown that, uh, and when I say we, I don't mean this, not, this is not research from our clinic, but it's, it's from the scientific community at large. It's been shown that when a child is administer an antibiotic at three months compared to at six months of age compared to at nine months of age compared to at 12 months of age, the later that you can delay the first introduction of antibiotics into an infant's mm -hmm. life, the less harmful it is in terms of causing conditions later in life like allergy, eczema, atopic dermatitis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And, the, and along the same lines, the earlier that a probiotic is administered, the more beneficial it tends to be. 
So right. there's a there's a key component of this which is timing, uh, but the, these these early life factors do seem to have a big influence on disease later in life. And, and then there's also current day factors, which are as people's diets become progressively less healthy and they're eating more sugar and more processed foods and there's more emulsifiers in those processed foods and we're under more stress, all these things will contribute to and kind of exacerbate some of the, uh, you know, some of the conditions that you mentioned a moment ago, like IBS yeah. and IBU. Yeah, a couple of other factors that came to mind was the overuse of antibiotics by doctors very early on. Uh, you know, of course, we already addressed uh, breastfeeding versus formula, which is breastfeeding introduce healthy bacteria to the to the baby's system, and and help strengthen the immune system. And the other one, which uh, it seems like a lot of people try to avoid talking about, is GMOs and uh, uh, excess use of glyphosate, which is toxic to our system. Can you speak about this? Yes, so, so the antibiotics we, we covered briefly. Um, the, the GMOs, I haven't done a, a comprehensive review of the literature on GMOs yet. So I, I can't speak to that directly. Certainly, I think theoretically, the potential for them to be contributing to problems in the gut is, is very plausible. It's just I try to be careful in my commentary unless it's something that I've researched firsthand because I have found that in the field of you know integrative and alternative medicine, there's a lot of great truths, but there's a lot of misnomers that have just been, people think this, people keep citing the same incorrect information and it's kind of a self-propagating, you know, erroneous belief that, that kind of just has legs. Um, I'm, I would think it'd be very fair to surmise that when going through a review of the literature on GMOs, we'd probably find some evidence showing that they can act as gut irritants. But I'd also probably be inclined to think, this is just my opinion, my speculation, that they wouldn't be a problem for everyone. And you know, periodic exposure probably wouldn't be a big deal except for to a small subset of patients that are very, very sensitive. The only reason why I make that qualifier is because sometimes I see patients in the clinic that get so afraid of food because they keep mm -hmm. learning about all the different bad things that food could do to them, that they almost feel paralyzed that they can't eat anything ever. So I, mm -hmm. I try to let people know that, you know, if your if your day to day diet is healthy, you can afford exposure occasionally to GMOs, and it, it may not be a, a hugely uh, deleterious endeavor. Um, the uh, Glycosate, I think, is also very interesting, and there have definitely been some papers that have correlated use to uh, one paper in particular to the increase in celiac disease. And, and so I think there's definitely something there, and uh, I certainly think that the, these adulterations to food are definitely not helping us in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Right, right. So um, switching subject, I understand you're in the process of writing a book. What is the book about, and can you tell us a little more? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is all about the importance of one's gut health, and we go into a lot of detail about many of the things that we've discussed, early life factors and how early life factors affect the formation of your gut microbiota and your gut immune system and how that can affect your health through your entire life, things that can be uh, affected by problems in the gut. So like we discussed early in the call, how a problem in the gut can manifest as insomnia, acne, and depression, and may not even manifest as any overt digestive symptom. And we also talk about different diets that can be useful, different treatments that can be useful. And, and essentially the, the, the book, I think, is a very interesting narrative on how important gut health is for one's overall health, how, how foundational and fundamental it is. Mm -hmm. And then the book concludes with a self-help plan that takes all the information that we've discussed and puts it into a personalized sequence of steps so as to help people get healthier. And one mm -hmm. of the key aspects of the personalization is so that people can become healthier but not having to do any more than they need to to become healthier because we may have two different people who read the book. One person may be very young, very healthy, and just have minor symptoms and minor imbalances, and they may only need to go through two steps of the eight that are listed or the eight that mm -hmm. are potential. But then whereas you may have someone who is in their, let's say in their mid-40s, who has had chronic inflammatory bowel disease that's relapsing and remitting, 
and they may have more severe imbalances and more severe symptoms. And so they, mean to, they may need to go through six of the eight steps in order to totally see resolution of their, of their complaints. And it's essentially taking what I do in the clinic and I've kind of you know, uh, comprised it into a, a algorithm where you respond this way to step one and then that leads you here or it leads you there. And, and so mm-hmm. um, I'm very excited about the book from the perspective of uh, it's not just – a, a, a book that gives you some interesting information about the gut and a few tips. It gives you some inter- interesting information about the gut, but then it's not just a few generic tips. These are tips that have been really crafted by my years in the clinic, applying this information and learning the best way to sequence people through some of the therapies and techniques for optimizing their gut health. So um, uh, I'm very excited about it. It's been a labor of love over the past year, a uh, few yeah. years. And, and uh, you know, another thing about it that's really important to me is educating people, but not making them afraid of food, not, right. and, and I think sometimes this happens, and, and I don't think any author ever does this intentionally, but if you're not very careful in the words you use and the way that you describe things, and you only describe how, how things can be a problem, how they can be a problem, how they can be a problem, but you never take a moment to say, here's how much of a problem, here's how much of a concern you should be. Uh, making out of this, then people can go to the very, you know, most extreme endpoint. And unfortunately, I see some of these people in the clinic who they've stopped eating out. They've stopped having a drink on the weekends with their friends. They've stopped enjoying any off-plan food because they've gotten so scared of all the potential bad things in the food supply that they forget that having a, a life and having some fun is also a very important part of health. And so it, I'm excited about the potential to give people a, a pretty reasonable narrative on how to improve their health. Right. right. Um, that sounds very interesting. Um, when do you expect the book to come out? I'm hoping it'll be out late this year, late 2017. Uh, if we miss that window, it'll be out early 2018. The, the book is pretty okay. much done. We're just going through some of the, the editing. And, and with my spelling and grammar, that's, that's no <laughs> easy, <laughs> easy task. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe we can trade books then. I'll send you my anti-GMO book and uh, all my research on that subject and you can send me a copy of yours. Yeah, you know, I would love out. that I, because I, I haven't, like I said a moment ago, admittedly, I haven't gone into a dive of the literature on anti-GMO, so it's definitely an area that I'm, I'm super open to learning a little bit more about. Yeah, as a, as a chef and nutritionist, I, when I deal with, uh, when I consult with a patient or client, um, what I try to do is I try to explain the good of the food, but also as a chef, I also provide them with re- tasty recipes so that they are not afraid to eat that food because it's it's French cuisine, so it's good stuff, right? right? It's not just like some boring kind of food. So uh, sure. I understand how people can be overly concerned about food because they read all of this stuff uh, both on the internet and, uh, and and then they're afraid to do eat anything. But there's something to, to be said about it because like uh, when I go out personally because I'm very picky with my food because that's what I do. Okay. Uh, I do, I do suffer the consequences. You know, I do I notice that the next day or two uh, I'm not feeling comfortable or I'm bloated or until I get back on my, my healthy diet when I've gone out to a like a regular restaurant and you don't know where they got their food, what kind of oil they use, uh, what kind of meat they, they're getting. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Sourcing and all that. So I think it's very important for people to know it's not just the food, it's also the quality of the food that's important. I agree, completely agreed. And, and yeah. one of the things I try to help contribute to that picture with my work with the patients that I work with and, and with the book that will soon be released is if we can try to optimize your gut health, we can mitigate the, the amount of reactions you have when you do eat off plan so that we can right. try to make you as, as resilient and, and robust as we can. Right. Because, right. yeah, what you're describing is, is definitely a legitimate reality. Sometimes some restaurants use rancid oils or poor quality foods and you suffer the consequences. But hopefully, if we can get your gut resilient enough, you can you can deal with that without a lot of you know, repercussion. Right, right. And um, I forgot to ask in, uh, in the question there, but uh, were you at the Paleo FX uh, 2017? 
I was. I, I did a lecture on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as, as one of the most overlooked imbalances in the gut that can be contributing to symptoms. And I also okay. sat on the what your gut is telling you panel. Right. Too bad I missed that. I was there. It's, here's my tissue yeah, to I prove see. it. I, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was there as a volunteer, but um, I just didn't have time to see everything. You, you were bit, yeah, as a volunteer, yeah. you're going to be pretty busy. Yeah. So um, you also offer your own podcast, which is called Dr. Ratio Radio. Uh, what do you discuss on your show? And uh, just, you know, briefly sure. explain. Sure. So the, the podcast started about, about two years ago now, and it's, it's really grown quite quickly, which, is, which has been nice to see that the, the work has been received very, very uh, eagerly. And we discuss many, uh, many of the concepts in gut health that we've been discussing today, we'll go into detail about. So we'll talk about probiotics or enzymes or IBS or inflammatory bowel disease, low FODMAP diets, fasting, you know, all these different types of, of interventions that can be useful for the gut. Uh, so the, the gut is a, a very common topic. We also talk quite a bit about thyroid because that's the other area that I'm interested in and I do a, a bit of uh, focus on. And then we also talk about a smattering of, of other concepts where we might interview a author of a, of a particular book or a researcher or talk about some of the latest research that's been published uh, in, in healthcare. So it's definitely very kind of health, uh, health and, and medicine focused, but we try to keep the concepts accessible to people. And um, maybe one of the other more important themes to mention, like I've hinted to earlier in the call, is trying to give people practical information that's not overzealous, that's not gonna cause fear, that's gonna really help them, empower them, um, again, with a focus of, of gut and, and thyroid. Cool, cool. That's important service there. Um, now, I know and I read that more and more people are going towards uh, <clears throat> alternative medicine because they just don't trust Western medicine anymore. The problem is uh, insurance are not paying for it and it makes our jobs difficult because you know, people are going to think twice about spending money out of pocket when the the insurers could pay for it. So, in your uh, in your opinion, what is the future of functional medicine in that aspect? Uh, do you think that eventually insurance will accept um, the kind of work you do and pay for it, or are we going to struggle for another ten years before something happens? Right. Well, that's a that's a great question, and I I you know to to the to the comment that people are are trusting their conventional doctors less. I, I understand where, where people are coming from, and I, I think it's important that we take a step back and we look at the healthcare system as the conventional medicine doctor isn't able to provide everything for someone. They're they're really kind of like your disease detection and your disease management doctor. And that's what they're going to be the best at. And alternative medicine is not going to be the best at that. Alternative medicine is not going to perform thyroid cancer screenings, colorectal cancer screenings, right? So um, they're, they're different. And you, you wouldn't go to your uh, natural doctor for a colorectal cancer screening. And you may not, it may not be fair to ask your conventional doctor to know everything about probiotics for IBS, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's important that we make that distinction between the two and we go to each in each per type of per provider for what they're the best at and not expect them to be the jack of all trades. And I think if you, if you approach your healthcare that way, you can come out with a much better prognosis or a much better situation. And then to the point of insurance, I do think we're gonna start seeing insurance cover more of these diet and lifestyle uh, based interventions. And you're already seeing some major corporations realize that you can save quite a bit of money when you invest in your employees' health and wellness. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think we will see more there happening. However, there's another issue, and this is something I, I uh, touched on briefly a little earlier in our discussion, is sometimes in alternative medicine, we're way overzealous with our testing. And yeah. this, is a, this is a big problem because it's not going to, it, it's going to hinder further acceptance and integration of alternative medicine into the insurance model. Because if, if your testing is, is very excessive, 
then it's not a cost effective care model. Mm -hmm. And so it limits the people that we can reach and help. And this is something I've been a, a huge advocate of is cost effective functional medicine. And it's important to, to realize that more testing does not equal better results. And, and well, I think uh, part of that is a result of, um, you know, fear of being sued and uh, liability and so on. So well, it's issues. In, in conventional medicine, maybe, but really in, yeah. in, in alternative medicine, many of the, of the tests that are used are not used to, the, to detect overt diseases. So the potential for, uh, you know, malpractice liability is very minimal because the, the, the test isn't telling you about a disease that if you missed said disease, you'd be liable. Mm -hmm. I think where it really comes from is alternative providers are well-intentioned, but I, I don't think many of us have, have realized that we don't have to order more testing to get better results. It, mm -hmm. it's, an easy, it's an easy assumption to make, right? Someone's sick, I want to help them, totally get that. So if I order more testing and I'm, I'm very comprehensive, I'll increase the probability, I'll find the cause of the problem and get this person well. But that doesn't tend to be the case for two reasons. One, many of the tests that are used have not been validated to be clinically relevant. And as an example, there was, there was one lab that did urinary testing for neurotransmitters, which are brain chemicals that help with anxiety, depression, and focus. And you know, I, for years, people had come to me saying, you know, can we order this test? Patients had asked about it or other clinicians had asked me where I recommend doing this for their patients. And I had repeatedly said, you know, no, I don't really see the, the clinical utility of this. Uh, several months ago, they pled guilty to fraudulence because they were yeah. manipulating the lab ranges and the lab ranges were shown to have no, you know, relevance to any kind of clinical treatment. So I don't say that lightly. Uh, there are, there are tests that, that, show you, yes, a high or a low, but that high or a low is pretty much meaningless in terms of it hasn't been connected to any treatment or any condition. So the one reason is because some of these tests aren't clinically relevant. They're, they're interesting, but they're just academic. Right. And then uh, the other is because as a clinician, if you're ordering testing that isn't meaningful, what you're doing is you're trying to treat something that doesn't mean anything, and that makes the clinical process more difficult and so it actually can make it harder to be a good clinician if you're ordering testing that's not accurate. But those, as those things change, I think we'll, we'll see broader acceptance into the insurance model. But even if you don't have full insurance coverage, if you're working in a cost-effective model of functional medicine, meaning only ordering the few tests that are highly meaningful, then you bring the cost way down. And I can tell you that many, many patients have sought me out because of just that and, and it's it's been alarming to me how they've gone to see a provider and that provider has wanted to order a few thousand dollars worth of testing out of the gate again i think right. it's, it's it's well intentioned right the, the provider wants to help you and it's well intentioned i think it's mm -hmm. more so a fault of the educational system in alternative medicine being influenced by lab companies yeah and, yeah. and doctors having a hard time figuring out what to do when and, and what is legitimate and what is not legitimate um, but they'll, they'll come in and, and we'll order maybe $800 to $1,200 worth of testing if the person has no insurance coverage, and that yeah. will be more than enough to help them. Or if they have insurance coverage, their out-of-pocket expense may only be a couple hundred dollars for testing. So we, we, we can do it more efficiently. And that's what, in, in some cases, people are afraid to go to doctors because they know they're going to be you know, thrown uh, half a dozen tests that's going to cost them thousands of dollars, they, they just don't they just don't go to the doctor. That's it, because they, right. they know they can't afford it. It's just no, uh, you know, uh, for people that don't have a health plan provided by a corporation or, you know, good quality health plan, um, pretty much everything comes out of pocket, you know, because the... Obamacare, as it stands, is a very poor coverage. And so we, we as patients, we have to, we, we, we have to wonder, is, it, is this worth it? Is this worth it for me to go to doctor and being told you have to take this test and that test? When I, um, uh, last year when I did my uh, yearly um, physical, 
I was shocked when I saw the bill. Now, I didn't pay for it because it's preventative, so that, that is covered. Uh, but the, the labs charge $1,500 for a regular blood test. It's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I had to pay that, there was no way in hell I was going to. I was going to get it done unless I was really, really, really sick. But as a routine exam, as a routine exam, I think it's outrageous. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that, <laughs> that makes your job difficult because people are suspicious that as soon as you cross, you know, uh, your cabinet door, they're going to say, oh, you, we have to do this, we have to do all of that. And then you go, whoa, you know, I can't afford to do all of this. And, um, that's what it's, it's kind of a shame in the sense that we should not be afraid to go to a doctor because of financial reasons. But unfortunately, the system is such that in some case, that's, that's what happens to patients. No, it, it's, it's, it's a very legitimate concern and it's definitely a reality. And the, I think the real travesty is, is that to help people, you really don't have to do a lot of lab work. You have to do some and you have to be invested in your health care, meaning if you're not willing to spend any money or put in any effort, then nobody right. can help you, right? Mm. But if you're willing to make a reasonable effort and a reasonable investment, you can. And, and just to give a, a couple of quick examples, let's say somewhere were to come into my office. Now, um, after we've gone through the, the base of that pyramid that I described a moment ago and, and discuss diet and lifestyle. If we haven't gotten optimum results, we might do some testing. But that testing out of the gate may look like a, a breath test for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, $200. And mm -hmm. a stool test, maybe $300. Right? That's, that's reasonable, I think. Now, mm -hmm. what we're not going to do is a food allergy test. So that's about three to $500 we've just saved. And adrenal fatigue test, that's another $200 we've just saved. So those are two of the tests that are oftentimes ordered, which I have found are not needed. They're really not needed. And so I just cut the person's lab bill from probably $1,100 down to about $500 just by focusing on the testing that was most relevant right out of the gate, mm -hmm. right? And that makes a big difference because if months later you're going to retest the findings, that's right. that same bill, at, you know, X2. So it's $500 once, $500 again, or $1,200 once, and then $1,200 again. So it, right. it, it very quickly adds up and can either save you a lot of money or, or drive the cost way up. And again, it, it doesn't mean that you don't get people better results. In fact, I would argue that by focusing on the, the most core issues, you actually get someone better results because you're not distracted trying to treat these other other tests. So yes, it, it's, um, it's a legitimate concern. And I think by... by uh, being cognizant of this will be able to reach and help more people. And I do think it's, it's the evolution or the future of functional medicine, like anything else with, with time and with, you know, new waves and new generations of doctors, we should be updating and improving what we're doing. And I think this is the next evolution of integrative alternative and functional medicine is really trying to cut the fat, so to speak, and focus on the things that are the most shown to be beneficial mm -hmm. and meaningful. Well, good, good. I like to hear that. Uh, on the positive side, uh, I hear and I read that um, some hospitals are starting to integrate um, alternative healing, like uh, nutrition, acupuncture, massage therapy, and and um, you know, in California, of course, they're typically ahead of the time when it comes to those issues. But I, um, a friend of mine, told me that MD Anderson in Houston is also starting to add alternative medicine uh, choices to their treatment as well for cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's nice to see that. I think with every, with every passing couple of years, the, the, the line between conventional and alternative medicine is, is being blurred, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is also the fact that the customers are demanding it. There's, there's a demand for those services. Yeah. And these and, services work. I mean, if you if you yeah. read the the clinical literature, many of these services they work. And and so, how long can you keep out of the care model things that work just because they're not drug based, which is kind of what conventional medicine has been all about? There's been more money in drugs. There's been more research in drugs. So you know the the doctors have have stayed to what the studies show. 
But now, as studies are branching more into probiotics and diets and some of these anti-inflammatory herbs and, and certain vitamins, we're seeing, wow, you know, symptom reduction, disease risk reduction with mm. these things. So how, you know, how long can we just kind of keep those things out just because they're different than what's been done typically in the conventional model? And that's, uh, I think, a big reason why we're starting to see a lot of the integration. I, I think probiotics is probably one of the best examples. You see some very promising results in IBS and IBD with probiotics. And so for a gastroenterologist not to be using probiotics as part of their practice is, is probably pretty silly, but a lot still aren't. But you're, I think you're seeing more of an acceptance as that, that wealth of research is building. Um, and so you're seeing you know, this, this, this integration of the two, which is great, yeah. Right, and speaking of probiotics, um, uh, an assumption that I believe for a long time is that, uh, for example, I use probiotics as a preventative. Uh, some people at Paleo FX said that probiotics should not be thought as a way to heal, but just as a way to recede the gut. What's your opinion on that? Mm, yeah, so the, the receding is, is not true. The majority of probiotics do not repopulate your gut. That's, and that's okay. something that we discussed on the, the panel. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, you know, but it, it's, it's a misconception that I think is slowly being overturned. And we, we now know that, again, most probiotics do not colonize you, but they do have a, a beneficial impact on the host. They're anti-inflammatory, they help stop or repair leaky gut, they help to rebalance the gut microbiota, meaning that they help to push out or um, kill off unwanted or overgrown bacteria and fungus. So they do have a beneficial impact on the host health, which is probably most important, and also some of the mechanisms that we think underlie that improvement in host health, like being anti-inflammatory, being antibacterial against bacterial overgrowths and bad bacteria and pathogens and such. Um, so you, you can use probiotics in a, in a long-term fashion, in my opinion. We do see some studies showing positive health outcomes when using probiotics in the long term. The only thing for people to be on the lookout is a small percentage of people may start to have side effects from probiotics. The most notable is probably bloating. For some people, they'll have a, a bloat reaction if the probiotic doesn't agree with their system or they've been using too high of a dose or they've been using it for too long. So probiotics can definitely be helpful uh, in a preventative fashion, in a long-term fashion, in my opinion. But they, the, the thing that they recede you yeah, is, is not the case. There's only really one, uh, one therapy that can recede or, or take up residence in your gut. And that's a, what's called a fecal micro, microbiota transplant. And this is where, so let me take a step back and, and describe the, the gut microbiota, the gut bacteria has often been described as an organ, right? So it's an organ inside of your intestines uh, that's about approximate size of the liver has been described. And so when you do a fecal microbiota transplant, you're essentially taking that organ from someone else, their, their gut bacteria, and you're transplanting it into a new host. And this is done by taking the feces of a healthy donor and usually through an enema, administering it into an ill host. And that can actually repopulate their gut. But that's not a therapy that is, you know, a, a frontline therapy. That therapy I would only recommend for people that have exhausted every other therapeutic uh, option and haven't seen optimum results. How, how uh, concerning would be severe, um, um, how do you call it? Um, I, I had it and it just went away. Um, where you can poop. Constipation? To yeah, constipation. Okay, <laughs> uh, is that uh, is obviously that's a gut problem, but where does it come from, and how do you deal with it? There's there's a couple different causes of, of constipation. Uh, I'll start with maybe the the most common, 
And the most common may be, well, firstly due to diet, right? So, some people, if they're eating a poor diet that is either too high in fiber or too low in fiber or high in inflammatory foods will end up causing constipation. So again, mm -hmm. let's not forget the basics. Um, mm -hmm. But second to diet, certain bacterial overgrowths have been shown to lead to constipation. So with, with breath testing that I mentioned a moment ago, if we see high levels of methane gas in someone's breath, that's been shown to correlate and, and cause constipation. And more importantly, the treatment of that gas that, or the treatment of the bacteria that are causing that high gas has then shown the ability to help ameliorate constipation. So I, I make that, that, clarify, that clarifying note because if we show two things correlate, the next step is to show treatment of that piece leads to an improvement. And we have shown that with this uh, methane, high methane in the breath, treatment of the organisms that cause the high methane has been shown to reduce or uh, aid or improve constipation. So certain bacterial overgrowths can be one cause. And another cause can be problems with motility. Sometimes uh, people have disrupted motility and there are certain therapies that can be done that can be helpful with motility. Uh, like it's a little bit nuanced and then another may be obstruction in the bowel and people can mm. sometimes have scar tissue if people have had inflammatory bowel disease intestinal surgery if they've had uh, maybe very bad endometriosis then these things can lead to scarring in the gastrointestinal tract that may impede the intestinal tract and that may cause constipation there's therapy that can be done to break down that scar tissue. And then there's also connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos uh, syndrome where people have really soft connective tissue. And right. so the, the, essentially the guts aren't held in place and things can kind of like, you know, collapse in and, and slough. And then that can occlude on the intestinal uh, lumen and be problematic with constipation. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those things are a little less common. The, the adhesions and the, the connective tissue disorders are a little less common. What's far more common are overgrowths of organisms that produce this methane gas that cause constipation or problems with motility. So there, right. but there's, there's definitely some, some therapies that can be very effective for constipation. Right. That is a problem. You're right. It is a problem. If you're only pooping a few times a week or one time a week, then that's, that's something that needs to be looked into. And if, if you're not pooping at least once a day, then it's definitely something that needs to be investigated and, and corrected. Yeah. The person I'm thinking about is, um, it's gone days without, you know, going to the bathroom, and uh, and it worries me because it's, it could be. And she's tried every Western medicine, um, you know, either medication or uh, laxatives, and some of them are quite harsh, and uh, I don't like the sound of it. So maybe I'll uh, I'll give her your <laughs> connection, and she can talk to you. Sure. Because because it looks like uh, a doctor's not helping her. Um, Mark, your turn. <laughs> My turn. Um, I want to come come back to basics a little bit. Um, obviously, you you work uh, in tandem with someone's doctor, um, but how can you know a normal person find a, a good quality functional medicine practitioner like yourself? Well, we did do an entire podcast, and I believe the title was was how to find a good functional medicine doctor or pr provider. So if, if people went to my homepage, there's a search box in the upper right hand corner. If they just searched functional medicine doctor or how to find a functional medicine doctor in the search box, they should see that post come up fairly quickly. And I, I run through how to find the, the right provider for you and then some red flags. So there, there's, there's a couple broad strokes that I should mention. Um, first, you have everyone who, to, who, who practices functional medicine uh, from a nutritionist all the way up through conventional doctors or, or different types of doctors. Um, so where you are depends on what type of provider you may want to work with. If you mm -hmm. haven't even changed your diet yet, working with a functional nutritionist is probably going to be an adequate starting point, right? Go through some of the dietary basics. If you have pretty moderate to severe recurring inflammatory bowel disease, then you may want to go to the other end of the spectrum with someone who's got a little more training 
especially mm. if you have a condition that you've already changed your diet a couple times and you still haven't seen the optimum results, then again, you may want to go to the more clinical, the more doctor end of the spectrum rather than the nutritionist end of the spectrum. Uh, so, you know, that, that's important because you don't need to, if you're only driving down the street, you don't need to drive in a Ferrari, right? <laughs> but if you're doing, if you're doing a race, then you may want to take the Ferrari. So, um, you know, and that, that matters because the, the cost will change, right? To go to a clinician like myself, just for some basic dietary advice, certainly I can give you good, competent dietary advice, but you may be spending more than you need to coming to see me if you haven't even changed your diet. So um, that I think is important just realizing there's a, there's a spectrum of providers trying to find the provider that's the right fit for where you're entering into the conversation. Uh, and then there, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a couple other things that are important and that's looking for a provider who, um, especially if you're more on the clinical end, looking for a provider that has a focus that's overlaid to what you need. Mm -hmm. So if you have inflammatory bowel disease or you have irritable bowel syndrome and you're going to see a doctor who focuses on metal detox or on Lyme disease, then that may be, that may be off from the, the area of focus that you need. Yeah. Now you may not know what you need, so then this isn't relevant. But if you do know what you need, what you're, what you're grappling with, then that can be helpful. And then there's also some red flags. Um, one red flag is if someone seems overly opinionated Mm -hmm. And the reason I, I caution about those that are overly opinionated is because the more you learn, the more you realize that whatever you think, there's contradictory information to what you do think. Mm -hmm. So that makes you more tempered in your opinion. And I can speak for myself and say the level of uh, me being opinionated today compared to five years ago is, is way tempered because as I've continued to learn more, I've learned, you know, the paleo diet is great, but there's these other diets that may work better for other people, other times, other conditions. So even though I'm still a very big proponent of the paleo diet, I don't come out and say the paleo diet is the one diet, the healthiest diet, the diet for everybody. So if you get that kind of, you know, absolute um, dogmatic or overzealous opinion from someone, it's likely a barometer indicating that they're not very well versed on the topic. And if they're not very well versed in the topic, what you're probably going to get is their narrow view on healthcare, and it's going to be applied to everybody rather than someone who's got a wide view and can say, your person A, this will be best for you. Your person B, this will be best for you. Your person type C, this will be best for you. So be caution of those that come off very, very dogmatic and very rigid in their approach. Hmm. And the other would be for providers that, to get you started, want a, a heavy investment up front. And there are exceptions to this rule, but as a general rule, in my opinion, if, if someone wants you to do several thousand dollars worth of lab testing just to get started, mm -hmm. then you know, if you're talking three, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars of lab testing just to kind of get started, I oftentimes think that that's more of a model that's set up to make things as easy as possible and run everyone through the same testing rather than which which again doesn't mean someone has any bad intentions but they're probably not very keen on trying to make the care as cost effective as possible mm -hmm. which is why in my office we do an exam visit first and then we decide on what testing we want to order because by listening to what someone says i may be able to cut down 80 percent of the testing that we could have done and focus on that 20 percent um, so if you're, if you're being presented with this, you know, very large bill right out of the gate, it, it, again, doesn't mean the person has bad intentions, but cost effectiveness may not be high on the priority list. And so if you're trying to be, you know, cost efficient, then that may be something to be cognizant of. So those are just a few, much, a few things. Yeah. So it's very much a case of experience counseling. Really. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now, and also uh, you, you say you you like to work with a person as normal doctor how do you find the conventional uh, physician's attitude towards you for instance that's a, it's a good question i think it depends more so on the the doctor's personality than it does on me <laughs> right um you have some doctors that are open some that are not 
And I understand where the lack of openness comes from because, you know, as, as someone in the alternative field, and, and as I criticized a moment ago, sometimes we're overzealous. We order tons of lab tests and it hasn't been validated and we make patients afraid of food. So if you're a conventional doctor seeing patients come in and struggling with that, then I could get as a conventional doctor how you'd be reserved in how strongly you recommend alternative medicine. So that part I get. But there's also the other part of being evidence-based and realizing, for example, diets can be very helpful for many of these conditions or certain herbs or probiotics can be very helpful. So, um, you know, some, some doctors are cognizant of that. They get that and they're, they're encouraging and we can have really nice dialogues. Every once in a while you get a doctor that's very kind of hard headed and it's almost no matter what you say or do, they're going to be resistant. So, what I would offer to the, to the audience is if you have a doctor that seems to be resistant no matter what, you could still use them and just put them in the box of, okay, you're going to do my disease checkups and my disease management, and hopefully I'll never have a disease, and then I'm going to work with my other doctor, and they're going to do the, the preventative work. You can, you can you know, do it that way, but I think the, the ideal approach would be to find a doctor who does their disease you know, monitoring and management but is also open to things on the other side of the fence and willing to integrate and work collaboratively should the opportunity present itself. Now, now you did mention earlier that sort of some of the, the foods that we would commonly regard as being healthy uh, for the gut are actually unhealthy when it comes to things like um, you know, the microbiome. I'm talking about sort of asparagus and cauliflower and that sort of thing. Um, how about things like kimchi and uh, fermented foods and that sort of thing? How, how, are, how do they fit into your protocols? Great question. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the comment I made a moment ago that, that those foods aren't healthy for the gut, it, it's, again, it's important to contextualize that, that it's not, they're not unhealthy, but if people have a, a pre-existing overgrowth, then mm -hmm. they, they can be problematic. Right. Um, in, in terms of fermented foods, I think fermented foods can be very healthy for the gut. And you know, kimchi, sauerkraut, kombuchas can definitely be helpful. I think they're a, a good food for people to incorporate into their you know, daily or weekly diet for, for most people. Now, there's a subset of people that they have to be a little bit careful with these foods. And these are people that have what's known as histamine intolerance. And, and the most typical presentation that denotes someone might be histamine intolerant is someone that has IBS type symptoms, especially if it's more diarrheal type IBS. So gas, bloating, abdominal pain, and they tend toward looser, more frequent stools. Right. Now, these people can have bacterial overgrowth, like I mentioned a moment ago, and they can also have what's known as histamine intolerance, which is essentially, histamine is a, is a compound found in, in foods and also that is secreted by bacteria. And histamine is not a bad thing, but if you're someone that doesn't process histamine well, then it can be easier for you to have too much histamine in your system. It's kind of like pouring water into a sink. We all have a drain, and pouring water into a sink isn't a bad thing, but if you have three gallons and you're pouring three gallons into a sink at the same time, you may overflow the sink. Yeah. That's what can happen with histamine, and that can manifest as looser stools, abdominal pain, neurological symptoms like brain fog or irritability, insomnia, lightheadedness, feeling flush, rashes. So there, a joint pain is another symptom that can manifest as. And so these patients tend to do very well from a, a histamine elimination and then reintroduction. And histamine-rich foods in part are fermented foods because of course they have live bacterial cultures and those bacteria mm. release histamine. Um, so for some of these people, they have to temporarily restrict their dietary histamine to let the sink drain, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then they can reintroduce it. I should also mention that for a diet like the low FODMAP diet, that isn't necessarily a diet that has to be done in perpetuity, but rather eliminate the high FODMAP foods and then later reintroduce. And that tends to be a reoccurring theme with most diets where you do a shorter term elimination and then you reintroduce to your tolerance. Right. Excellent. I'm glad. Thank you for clearing that up. It was something that was going through my mind as, as you were talking. Now, one thing that, that did jump out at me, you were, you were talking about um, how a, 
um, and overgrowth can even cause things like acne. And um, when we see the amount of kids nowadays that seem to have acne, uh, what mm. would you say that they should start doing that they're probably not or not do that they probably are? Well, the, the foundation, again, would really be diet. I, I think for a lot of these kids, if we can get them off of the sugars, the sodas, the processed foods, and maybe if they're, if they're intolerant to things like grains or dairy, that in and of itself will probably produce a, a whole lot of improvement. Uh, and then next to that, you could try things like a probiotic, which can be very helpful, potentially a fish oil, especially if they're not getting a lot of fish in their diet. And then if none of those things produce adequate results, then you may want to get them to a clinician and look into something like, for example, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The treatment of, of that, that bacterial overgrowth has been shown in, in clinical trials to help improve rosacea which we thought there was not really much to do for rosacea other than topical creams, but we're realizing that, yes, you know, the gut affects the, the rosacea. Uh, and I can say that I've seen other skin conditions clear after we've improved the health of someone's gut. There's this old philosophy in natural medicine that essentially states that the skin is a reflection of the gut. Um, so, you know, how do we optimize the gut? Well, diet, like we talked about, we kind of our level one, and then maybe some things like probiotics could be level two, and then level three would be looking into an overt imbalance, potentially via some lab testing, and then treating through to fruition whatever imbalance was found. Super. Now, I mean, you've given us a whole raft of interesting and useful information. I think a lot of people are going to want to know more. Um, where's the best place they can find out? The, the best place to really plug in would be my website, which is drrusho.com, which is D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O.com. And then there's a few specific pages they can navigate to to, to get more on, on a, particular, a particular topic. Of course, if you go to the homepage, you can kind of plug into everything and you can use a search box if you have something in particular you want to know more about. But if you're someone that's looking to get clinical help, we do also advise patients who are not in our physical area via phone and Skype if they're, if they're farther away. So if you go to drrusha.com slash get help, you can get more information about that. If you want to be notified about my book when it releases, you can go to drrusha.com slash gut book. And if you're listening to this and you're a health coach or a nutritionist or a doctor and you're learning or you're wanting to learn more about how to kind of sharpen your clinical skills or practice this more cost-effective model of functional medicine I was espousing, then you can go to drusha.com slash review. And if you're a podcast listener, you just search my name, Michael Ruscio and podcasts, and you should find whatever you plug in through come up iTunes or Libsyn or what have you, and you can certainly follow our podcast for more. Super. Are you on things like Facebook and uh, that sort of thing? Yep, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all those. Um, you know, I'm, some of those, I'm not sure how it works. One thing posts to Facebook and it goes to Twitter and it goes to Instagram. So somehow I'm connected in on, <laughs> on all those things. Excellent. Well, thanks for everything today, Michael. It's been thoroughly interesting. Um, I think we should... Uh, Unless there's anything else either of you want to bring, I think we should bring today's program to a close. Yeah, well, no, thank you for having me. It's been a, a great discussion. Hopefully it's helpful to your listeners. And uh, I had a lot of fun chatting with you guys. Absolutely. Uh, thank you again, Michael, for being on the Low Carb Paleo Show and sharing your story with us. And like we say in Texas, a votre santé, yo. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for being with us. Thanks again.